I want to share a passage of scripture with you before we go today. Let's go to Mark chapter 15. And I'm just going to show you a couple of things. I'm not going to go through all of this, but my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the theme today. Now, you and I sometimes say this. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why, Lord, where are you? Lord, how far can you be from me? God, where are you? When I need you the most, you're not here. But all the time he is, and all the time he's whispering in your ear, if you could just hear it, my child, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. I want you to look at the cross with me for a few moments today. Mark chapter 15. I'm going to read some scripture, and I'll very, very quickly give you a couple of thoughts. And then you can go to Easter supper, dinner, wherever you want to go. Beginning with chapter 15 and verse 16. Now, Pilate had already released Barabbas. Jesus is bound and he's already been punished for whatever. Sinless, but he was punished. And he's released for crucifixion. Soldiers led him away, it says in verse 16. Into the hall called Praetorium. And they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple. And twisted a crown of thorns and put it upon his head. And they began to salute him. Saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and they spat upon him. And bowing a knee, they worshipped him. They weren't really bowing a knee to worship him. They were mocking him. Because it says, and when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, and he was coming out of the country and passing by. They compelled him to bear the cross. And they brought him to this place called Golgotha, which is translated a place of the skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garment, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of the accusation was written above, and they put it on the cross. The king of the Jews. When he was crucified with him, they also crucified two robbers, one on the right, one on the left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, ah, you who destroy the temple in three days, you're going to rebuild it? Because Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll build it up. He wasn't talking about the temple. He was talking about this temple. He was talking about his body. He says, you destroy this body in three days, I'll raise it up. They hollered up to him and said, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the religious people of the day, I just want you to get this picture. The chief priests also mocking among themselves, they said, hey, he saves others, he can't even save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we might see and believe. If we see Jesus bring himself down from the cross now, we'll believe in him. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Three hours later it says, now the sixth hour had come. And there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Three hours of darkness. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Some of those stood by, and when they heard that, they said, look, he's calling out to Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it up to him to drink, saying, let him alone, see if Elijah will come down and take him down. Jesus cried out with a, la with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. So when the centurion, I just want you to get this, when the centurion, who was the boss of all that was taking place there, he was a Roman soldier who was top brass, if you will, who stood opposite him, standing there, watching his men crucify the Lord. When he saw this, he cried, and he saw that Jesus took his last breath. He said, Truly, this man was a son of God. The greatest injustice that's ever been known to mankind was not the Holocaust. It was not the planes in the building. It was not World War II. It was not the Cambodian fields. It was not the Rwandan genocide. The greatest injustice ever known to man was Jesus died on the cross. The reason for it was he was sinless. He really was. He who knew no sin bore our sins, the Bible said. So here he is, a person who's sinless because he's the son of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish and have everlasting life. Now that means believes. Uh-huh. How do we believe? We believe by placing ourselves into him. Don't tell me you believe in Jesus because you've got it in your head that he was the son of God and he came here to this earth and so forth. No, you believe when you experience what Bill experienced. That's when you believe. That's when you believe. When you know that you know that you know, as Tim always says and others around here, when you know that Jesus really is the son of God, that he really died upon the cross and he really died for me, when you can say that to yourself, he died for me. The problem is we know he died for the sins of the world and so we celebrate Easter and we come to church and we do these things and we go through these ceremonial things, if you will, and we think, well, God must be happy with me now. I went to church. I spent some time in the house of God, so God's certainly going to be pleased with me. Let me tell you how God's pleased with you. When you bow your knee before him and you say, dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know. And, and you know, right away when you tell people they're sinners, we don't want to hear this. I sometimes wonder why the pews don't fill up. Maybe it's because I preach that man's a sinner. They don't like to hear that. But the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It says there's not one righteous, no, not one. Nobody's any better in this place than anyone else. Bill didn't stand up here and tell us how wonderful he is. He didn't tell us what he's done. He didn't glorify himself. He glorified Christ. He said, here's what Jesus did in this man's life. And this man was turning his life over to Christ. And he said, it's made a difference in my life. I've seen the difference. Others have seen the difference. We're seeing it. Why? Because Jesus really makes a difference in your life. He didn't deserve to die on that cross, but he did. And God performed two unbelievable miracles. God performed miracles in the scripture, by the way. If you'll do an in-depth study on miracles, you'll discover that God performed all these miracles to show that Jesus truly was the Son of God in power. All these miracles happened so that Jesus would be known as coming from God. So here he is now helpless and weak and beaten and worn and climbing up this hill of Golgotha, and he can't even carry his own cross. So Simon is called upon, will you please carry the cross? Oh, they didn't say please, they said, you carry the cross. That's the power they had in that day. And the people just the week before were saying, Hosanna in the highest, we welcome him who comes in the name of the Lord. He comes as God, we welcome him. They really wanted their political status to change. Here they were under Roman rule. They're Jews under Roman rule and they're hurting. Oh, the government was taking so much money from them. 
The government was hurting them. The government was oppressive toward them. And that was what was going on. So somebody deliver us. As a matter of fact, the word Hosanna, as we said last week, meant help us. They're shouting, help us. And we welcome him. Then so many things changed. Jesus on the cross. And now, God says, I'm going to give you something else. Darkness is going to come. The Bible said the third hour, that's nine o'clock in the morning, by the way. The third hour. Then at the sixth hour, three hours later, and this kind of death is the most excruciating death that any person could ever, ever experience. All the joints in your body come apart. The pain is excruciating. Jesus did not say, Oh, Father, if this cup could pass from me because the pain was going to be so bad. He said that because he was bearing the sins of the world. Oh, God, why hast thou forsaken me? Let me tell you why. Because God was showing who he was. Darkness came. There were those who were crucifying Jesus, harming Jesus, hurting Jesus in every way. And forgiveness was given to them too. Why? Because he was God in the flesh, dying upon the cross, bearing our sins. God the Father could not look upon that sin. God turned his back for a moment. The most excruciating pain Jesus ever experienced was to be separated from God the Father. He who was one from all eternity, now at this point on the cross, as the heavenly Father turned his back on him. Why hast thou forsaken me? I'm so glad he was received back into heaven when he came down off the cross, went into the tomb there three days, rose again. We serve a living Savior. Forty days later, ascended back to the Father. He was there and all of a sudden, he's gone. He's back to the Father. And they watched him go. And my Bible tells me that Jesus is alive today. He's the only religious leader in the world that's living. The only one. How do I know he's living? Let me tell you how I know he's living. Not only does it tell me in this Bible because some would say, well, I'll believe everything that says. Well, that's your choice. Let me tell you how he's living. How do you know he's living, Bill? How do you know Jesus Christ is alive? <laughs> he ans his answer was, because I experienced it. And I want to tell you something, my friend. You need to experience it. And if you've never experienced it, then stop talking about it, because you don't know anything about it. I love you, but you don't, okay? <laughs> Seriously. We think about it. We wander about it. But until we experience it, until it changes our life, we know nothing about it. Three kinds of people here today. Some of you are Christians. Some of you can say, as Bill just testified, and as the rest of us would, and as Tim stood up and said, yeah, me, I've been changed. Everyone else, hands up. Yes, I've been changed. You know Jesus is your Lord. You came today and you worship him today and you're going to leave this place in power knowing that Jesus Christ is alive. You're waiting for him to come back and receive you unto himself. You're waiting for the very end. You know heaven is your home. The second kind of person here today is someone who says, yeah, I'm a Christian, but deep inside there's nothing going on. You believe it, you have some kind of a knowledge. You know it in your head but you're not experiencing it in your life. It's hard for me to explain to people. How do you know you're saved? I know it because every morning when I wake up, I say good morning to Jesus. You can laugh, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what you think of me, it doesn't matter. I care about what he thinks of me. And when I wake up in the morning, I say good morning to Jesus. Where are you gonna take me today, Lord? I don't know where I'm gonna go, but I know this, you're gonna go with me Every step of the way, you're going to guide me, direct me, empower me, strengthen me, provide for me, give me the money I need, give me everything I need in this life. You're going to provide, I know, because he's all that to me. I have the experience. See? Bill says, I experienced it. I've experienced it. How many have experienced it? You don't have to put your hands up. But if you've experienced it, you know. But if not, you're that second person. And maybe today, you would like to say to God, God, I want to experience that. 
I want that kind of experience. I want to know that Jesus is my Savior. And you can do that, and you can know for sure right now that Jesus is your Savior. The third find, kind of person here today is a person who said, well, I just came. I'm just here. It's Easter. It's time to go to church, so here I am. I want to make so-and-so happy, or I want to make myself happy. I want to make somebody happy. I've come to church. Let's get this over with. Got to get to lunch. Got to get to supper. Got to do what we're doing to do. Got family things to do. Got whatever. It's Easter. We celebrate something. What are you celebrating? Christmas. What are you celebrating? Unless you celebrate Jesus Christ coming into this world. So here, here you are. Maybe there's some people in the second part of that who now would say, okay, I want to come over into the first part. For a long time I've been talking about it, thinking about it, I've been close to it, I've been warm with Christianity and all of that, but I really want to know in depth what it means to have Christ living in me. And the last person who really doesn't know him, I just want to say to you, my friend, listen. I hate to tell you this, but time's going to end very soon. I believe that. And I believe it because my Bible teaches me that. And I've watched things unfold. And you can't sit there and tell me that things aren't changing in your world very, very, very rapidly. And you know, every sign in the world we live in tells us Christ is coming back. This book's true. It's true. It's real. And you better give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. I say that with a smile on my face because I love you. I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I'm not trying to cause you any pain. I'm not trying to cause you any agony or any stress. But you've got to make the decision. And you better make it now while you have a chance. Because the Bible says today is a day of salvation. And you need to get ready. I promised I wouldn't keep you long and I don't want to do that. But I do want to give you that opportunity. Bow your heads with me if you will. you're here today and you do not know for sure that Jesus is your Savior, you need to experience that just like so many of us have. You might say, oh, but I have to give up this, I have to quit that, I have to stop that, I have to do this, I have to start doing that. You know what? You don't worry about anything you're going to do or don't do. Don't worry about that. What you worry about is when Jesus comes back, he's going to take those who are his those who have confessed their sin, those who have allowed Jesus to become their Savior. And if you haven't, you're going to be here to stand before the Lord, and you'll say, oh, but I went to church, and I did this, and I believed. And he'll look at you and say, depart from me. I never knew you. There's only two places a man's going to spend eternity, heaven and hell. And Jesus doesn't make that choice for you. He gives you freedom to make your own choice. And we live our lives every day doing our thing. You know why? Because God's given you a free will. It's your choice. And you need to make that decision. If you're here today, you do not know the Savior I'm talking about, this Jesus I'm talking about, in a very personal way. Would you now bow your head? Just bow your head. Pray these things. Don't worry about the consequences. Just pray. You'll see what happens. And say in your own heart to God right now, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner because everybody's a sinner and I'm one of everybody and I know that I need your salvation that salvation that you came to bring us as you died on the cross and I accept you as my savior now and I receive you right now and I want to experience this in my heart and know for sure that you are my savior the Bible tells us that his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God I know I'm a Christian because my spirit tells me that. Every head bowed and every eye closed, please. If you're here this morning and you prayed that prayer, would you just do me a personal favor? I wouldn't embarrass you for anything, I promise you. Would you just slip your hand up in a way that I know that you prayed that prayer and I can remember you in prayer and help you in any way? I won't come to you and embarrass you, I promise. Anybody at all, if you prayed that prayer, would you slip your hand up? Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. I 
see those things. Anyone else? Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, if you will, please. I hope that that which we've talked about here today will continue to ring true in your heart and mind and your life. I want you to have a blessed Resurrection Sunday. I want you to trust in God, believe in Him. Christians, listen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God is so good to us. And we glibly, in, in a sense, say, God is so good. Oh, yes, He's so good, you know, and we all repeat it and so forth. But I'm going to tell you something. God is not just good, He's great. And God cares about you in ways you don't even know. And God's looking after you in ways you don't even understand. And God's providing you for you in ways that you haven't even comprehended yet. And he's taking care of you. Thank him for it. Praise him for it. Live for him. Give your life to him. Let him have your life. He's waiting for you to serve him. Don't tell him you're a Christian. Tell him you believe and not serve him, not worship him. So next Sunday, come on home, will you? Father, we thank you for this time together today. I thank you for everything that's taking place here. May it all be Jesus. May it all be God. May it all be of him. Thank you for everything we've experienced. This is your day. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for us and for coming forth from the grave. Because of your resurrection, we will rise again. Thank you, Father. For every blessing you give to us, we glorify your name and we praise you for all that you do for us. Make us fountains of blessing in the lives of other people. Help us to help others and bless others and encourage others. Thank you for this time together. It's been precious. And we rejoice in your goodness and grace and mercy. Teach us as we go from this place how to minister to the needs of others. And for all you do, we will thank you and praise you and give you glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you so very much. Thank you for being here today.